Ladies and gentlemen, joining me on the show is Far Jack Jenkins. Now, Jack is a UFC featherweight uh, who, of course, went around the Australian regional scene collecting many a title. He's now 2-0 in the UFC after taking out Jamal Emmers by split decision at UFC on ABC 5, June 24th. Uh, this fight was in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, we have Jack Jenkins joining us and, of course, his head coach, the man that runs Absolute MMA, Simon Carson, uh, also nice little career himself uh, has fought in uh, 1FC and whatnot. Uh, so we've got both of them on the show to break down his fight against Jamal Emmers. Uh, the fight was, uh, like I said, split decision victory for Jack, and some people thought it could have gone Jamal's way. Uh, I personally thought, and I'm going to tell you now because he's not in front of me, but I thought it was probably 29 28 uh, Jack Jenkins, but the third round was quite heavily in favour of uh, Jamal Emmers. A real nothing round, but dominated technically on top with with uh, with the wrestling. And uh, but I think one and two with damage and whatnot went to went to Jack. Uh, once again, let let me know in the comments if you think I'm wrong uh, or, or wherever you are. If you're on YouTube or or Spotify on the on the podcast, uh, always feel free to hit us up or at Australian MMA underscore uh, on Instagram. Uh, but yeah, we're going to chat to Jack about the fight. Uh, his thoughts and, and, and hopefully if he can get on the Sydney card um, and, uh, and yeah it's look it's, it's very interesting to see a guy from Bacchus Marsh Victoria fly all the way to the east coast of America and, and try and get a job done while weight cutting and, and dealing with essentially his own finances uh, through it all so it's very very interesting um, Obviously, if you follow Jack, like I said, on the regional scene, you'll be very excited. Regardless, at the end of the day, uh, he's 2-0, and uh, he's, he's got a bright future, and he's going to be an absolute star. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, joining me on the show, a man who just picked up a split decision victory over Jamal Emmers at UFC on ABC5 in Jacksonville, Florida. He's now 2-0 and in the UFC. Far Jack Jenkins, mate, welcome. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Uh, now, joining you on the frame in the interview is your head coach, Simon Carson, kind of. <laughs> Hello, Amish. How are you doing? He's yeah, good. Come in. Yeah, good, good. Now, I, I want I want both of you on mainly because I want both of your thoughts. Uh, if you scour online, obviously, if you've watched the fight as well, uh, some say controversial uh, victory. I wanted to kind of get, first of all, your, your thoughts, uh, Jack, on if you thought you did enough to win and kind of your breakdown of the fight and, of course, uh, your opinion too, Simon? Um, yeah, I think it was probably close enough to go either way. I thought I did enough to win rounds one and two, and he definitely won the third. Um, and, uh, you know, the main criteria for scoring in MMA, as you know, is damage, and I think I did more damage in both the first and second round. Um, so, yeah, that, that's how it panned out. You know, if it, if I had gone the other way, I wouldn't have been bitching that it was a robbery in the other direction. And and Jamal certainly isn't doing that from his end. He he knows it is what it is. So, uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not too worried about the the controversy around the decisions. That's a, a a good lesson for me to get away with that one, having left it in the hands of the judges and it, it swing my way. That maybe next time don't let it do don't let it go to the judges. And uh, Simon, pretty similar to what Jack thought. Uh... Look, I thought he won one and two. I think, like, talking to him between rounds, I I'd said he'd won round one. Obviously, one judge gave it to Jamal. I was quite surprised about round one going against Jack on a card. Um, and then round two, I think he would have won it clearly if he just didn't fall off the back in the last, like, three or four seconds of that second round. But I thought apart from that, I think I said to him, I think you won one and two, but let's let's assume you haven't got two and try and get three. But obviously we didn't. I, I think we lost round three. I think that was probably the case on all judges' scorecards. But yeah, I thought he probably did. I thought he definitely round one one, and I probably would have thought it was like a sixty five thirty five that he won round two. I, I was really shocked actually afterwards hearing that after the fight had finished, how short price Jamal was with the. That with the odds, like you know how you can, yeah. they have like live line betting. After the fight, Jamal was a heavy favorite. I think that probably just goes more to like you know one and two, Jack one. Clearly, Jamal won round three. Um, but I think sometimes people then go, oh, well, overall that was the easiest round to judge, so we'll give that to Jamal. But I think if you look at the rounds individually, Jack probably won. I thought Jack fought really well, especially in the rounds one and two. And then I think probably round three was just a little bit conservative, maybe thinking he had it. Had one and two done. 
Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, one thing I kind of wanted to ask you as, as his coach, because of course, round three, uh, exactly what you said in public uh, sort of opinion, people always go, uh, it's like they're victims of the moment. So they see the last round and they go, okay, cool. Yeah. I reckon that guy, I reckon that guy won. Um, seeing Jack on his back, obviously everyone hasn't seen his jujitsu yet. Um, we, we laugh about the one trick pony stuff about the wrestling. We've obviously gotten to see the striking back in Perth, but how important is it now to show how dangerous he is off his back? Yeah, look, um, Jack, like I think to be honest, like Jamal was not ultra aggressive on top. So probably didn't force Jack into attacking, but then time eats up. He's on top. He wasn't really doing damage or, you know, like didn't get close to him any subs or anything like that. So perhaps, you know, Jack could have put a little bit more emphasis. I think I was calling for him to get his feet on hips and create more space and maybe start counter attacking his arms because he tends to extend a little bit. But, uh, uh, and I think at one stage, the referee gave, had given Jamal like two or three warnings on do something or we're going to stand you up. And then mm-hmm. in the end, I was like, hold on to him for a bit because I thought it was going to get stood up. And then, then it sort of drew out for a bit. And then Jack did obviously get up and then got to half guard and then just probably overcommitted on the near side and got, got roll like swept over. But um, yeah, look, I think, uh, you know, Jack is actually dangerous and does have good attacks off his bat. Jamal shut them down. Well, was very conservative. You know, if someone's just in your guard trying to shut down attacks, it's a lot easier to shut down if they're not being offensive and trying to pass or get, you know, get heavy shots off. So yeah, Jamal definitely sort of held him down and sort of secured like control time well, but I don't think it was particularly dangerous um, for Jack. And, uh, and, and Jack, uh, when it comes from a, a victory like this, obviously uh, no one's screaming necessarily for you to fight a ranked opponent. You know, it wasn't like a, a shutout victory or anything. So how do you sort of uh, mitigate going forward? You know, do you have an idea of who might be out there for you next? Yeah, I called out um, Nate the Train. I want to fight Nate the Train in Sydney. Um, I think that's a good fight. Stylic. Yeah, well, I think with the Jamal fight, this fight was like, it was, we took the fight on, was it five weeks? Yeah, something like that. We took the fight on five weeks' notice. I got my visa the day before we left. And stylistically, Jamal is a real tall, unorthodox, unorthodox striker who like bounces in and out. He doesn't sit in the pocket much which is like probably my hardest style to deal with. Um, so th- there was a lot of things with my back up against the wall coming up all the way over to the East coast of the U S as well. While you, you know, as you're starting to cut weight and that sort of thing. So th- there was a lot of things um, that made this fight, like not set up ideally for me um, and taking that on, I'm just happy to come out and I, that I got the win. So moving forward, I'm not too worried about the fact that it was a split decision or, you know, that it, that it wasn't an, a super emphatic performance because it's still a step in the right direction. And the other option would have been sit on the bench and wait for Sydney and then I'd be going into Sydney 1-0, and whereas now I'm going into Sydney 2-0. and So I'm not too worried about the fact that it was a split decision. Yeah, I would have liked to go in there and shut it out, but you can't, you can't you know, have a unbelievable performance every time you go and fight. So I just got to build on it. And what's the difference in preparation? Obviously uh, UFC Perth, that's a you know three hour flight as opposed to flying over the other side of the world, preparing for, for your second UFC bout. Oh, well pretty much everything's different, but even next time we do it, it'll be different it again because now I've got, I've got the two year visa because I'm on contract now. So next time we get told we have a fight in the US, there's no waiting period. Like I was, me and Simon, just to give you an idea of where we were at, we were sitting and I was on the phone to him or he's in his office three days before my visa appointment came through and we were saying, if the visa's not done by Friday, we're out of the fight. So, like, we're, we're dealing with leading up to the fight while you're still waiting to find out if you're actually going to go to the fight or not. So it just adds a layer of complexity that you have to deal with while you're still busting your ass training and cutting weight and doing all that sort of stuff. But from now... It, you know, it's it'll get easier because I've got that two-year visa. So now once we get the date, we can come over two weeks early. We can do a proper lead-in, get fully adjusted with the sleeping and that sort of stuff. Does the UFC help you out with any of that or is it just all on uh, poor Simon? No, it's, it's... Jack's very independent, I would say, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do a lot of it, but it's all on us financially if we want to come over. But even this time, like I probably spent, like by the time we pay for accommodation and flights for coaches and stuff like that, I probably spent 10, 15 grand on this trip. So when you look at it that way, it's like I spent that, but 
as an investment, I've gone to two and oh, and I get my win bonus now. Whereas if I hadn't spent that money and I had to come over the Tuesday of fight week and stuff, maybe that would have been the difference in the result going the other way and I would have ended up losing money. So are you, you know, obviously without going into numbers, are you still in the green like uh, Simon as well? Is it, or is it a lot of you guys still, are you in the early investing stages of, of, of Jack's career? Um, Simon will be forever in the red for running <laughs> for running a fight team out. Our fight team does nothing but cost him money. Um, I'll, I'll be... I'll, I'll be a little bit in the green. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be all right. And again, it's just a step in the right direction. You don't make your money in your first contract. You start making your money once you prove your worth and and get your wins on the board. So it's just about doing that for me now. My my goal's not on a short term capitalizing on it. It's about cap- capitalizing on it long term. Plus, you can now take that win. Obviously, work with dabble, make some bets, and get that right back up. Yeah. Well, actually, I actually got a message from <laughs> dabble. The other day, and I said, "Oh, sorry, boys, got to renegotiate that contract before July one now because uh, the market value's gone up." <laughs> <laughs> is that is that something actually? I mean, all jokes aside, is that something that you guys are aware of? Like that when you go to like you know two and oh, three and oh, like that your value does rise, or do you try and stay a little bit more grounded and a little sort of out of it and just focus on the fighting? Well, your market value is your market value. You've got to. I think you're um it's it's silly to have your head buried in the sand and go all I'm going to do is fight because that's all I have to do because that's not all you have to do there's there's other things you have to do and um you know like yeah you've got to you've got to try and make maximize your 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 branding and maximize your ability to sell that brand however you can and that's what I'm trying to do and obviously I've got a couple of deals now that are, that are doing all right with um, Dabble and I like working with them. And as long as it's companies you enjoy working with and that sort of thing, then why wrong? what's wrong with it? And uh, Simon, I wanted to ask you because it's uh, it's branched out from just sort of podcast interviews to now the UFC is giving praise to the great Ben P uh, and all your hard work is, <laughs> going, <laughs> is going unnoticed. Uh, are, you, uh, are you stoked that Ben P will be joining the coaching staff? Yeah, I'm just, I uh, can't wait to get him on board and, um, yeah, just ecstatic at the idea of it. No. <laughs> wait, wait, we can... Yeah, I did actually see that a, a shared post with Ben P in the UFC the other day, and I did. We, yeah. we... <laughs> Here's a question I've got for you, like in in terms of 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 people in the comments and whatnot of fights. Like you said, do you go back and forth uh, with it? Does it does it come into it at all? And does everyone in Bacchus Marsh always think you've won, or are there people a little bit more open and honest? I don't know if anyone from Bacchus Marsh would openly say I lost. There would there would be some people who might have thought it maybe, but I don't, yeah, it would be it would be it would be brave to to be from Bacchus Marsh and, and going around saying that I'd lost. But um, no, nah, I uh, cross was I in terms of like comments and stuff. If it's a real person who comments and I like I know or know of them in a fringe way or something, I might go back at them. But 99% of those comments, they're just fake accounts. They're just burner accounts. So you just got to take it as the internet. Like if you start getting worried about shit on the internet, you're going to have a miserable life because there is never ending beatdowns from any direction that you can cop. So you just got to deal with it and move on. Did you uh, did you uh, see Justin Tupper's fight? And uh, do you sort of know sort of his fallout from, from that eye poke? Yeah, I spoke to him last night. Um, his eye was bleeding... Like he was literally bleeding from his eyeball. He had to go straight to hospital, um, and he's just disappointed that he he didn't get the DQ and get a win bonus because obviously he's flying around here and, and invested money to get here and money to bring his team over as well, and then to have it end like that. So yeah, it's disappointing for him, but it was clearly accidental, and it was thirty seconds into the round. What do you do? That's like that's. That's the danger of those gloves. And uh, uh, back to the uh, featherweight uh, division, Ilya and uh, Josh Emmett, obviously a 50-42. <laughs> what are your thoughts on finally seeing scores like that in the UFC? Look, I'm of the opinion that there should be more 10-8s in MMA. Like, we just don't give them often enough. You should, if you dominate a round, and especially if you're dropping someone and, they're, you know, you're super composed and they're not, and you, you're just putting them on the back foot the whole time, I think we should see more 10-8s. Um, uh, a ten seven, I've never seen one. But if I, I would have to say that if there was ever going to be a ten seven, that would probably be the round. He was just 
smoking so close to a finish that, you know, a, a 10-7 doesn't seem out of this world. And with guys like that, uh, in terms of how you think you would fare against him, is that something where you don't even dive into that pool yet? Are you chomping at the bit to, to finally get a guy, you know, of, of that caliber? Or are you quite patient in, in those opportunities? Um, see, if I, think, I think if I showed up, Yesterday, the way I fought yesterday against the way Ilya fought yesterday, I reckon I would have got smoked. But I think if I show up, you know, a bit closer to my best against a guy like Ilya, I'm not that far off it or I'm right there. So um, I'm not in a big rush to get there. You've got to go through your tests as they come. But, you know, it was a big step up to Freddie on contender. Then it was another step up to Don. And then I think it was probably an even bigger step up in competition to, to Jamal yesterday. He's really underrated. So I'll take another step up in competition again, hopefully in Sydney in September, and then we'll, we'll see what happens from there. Awesome. So we are, uh, is it really looking like we will see you in Sydney or is this just a wish list? Um, I, uh, I had a quick word to Hunter Campbell um, as I was leaving the venue and, um, and I asked for it and he sort of said he would talk to Sean and they'd get back to me. So... We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, it's in their hands. But if you're the UFC and you've got a young featherweight who you've just signed who's on his first contract and he wants to fight at, in his home country uh, on a show that you've already booked, I can't see why you wouldn't. Like, there's what's the downside? Even if they have to fly someone from America or Europe or whatever, they're still saving money getting someone over to fight me. For my work out and the atmosphere, then... You know, I think you would you would bring me over just based on that alone. Awesome, mate. All right. Well, um, I really appreciate the time. Uh, it was it was just a great fight. I, I I really enjoyed it. Um, and can't wait to see you get back in there. Um, is there sort of anything because they didn't give you the opportunity to obviously have a post fight uh, interview? Is there anyone that you kind of wanted to thank? Was there any sort of story heading into this this fight that that you needed to get out there? Um, yeah, just my coaches, Andy Colgrave from the ring gym and, and Simon, and then, uh, all my, uh, my strength and conditioning coach, Matt Prince, uh, those guys help me all the time. Um, also, uh, Kane Davitt from pro world who, um, helped me with some, with some sponsorship stuff to, to help get my team over here for the fights, which was really helpful. So yeah, that, that's it for now. Awesome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the one trick pony, Jack Jenkins and the one FC one fight veteran head coach, Simon Carson. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks guys. Uh, fly back safe and I'll see you next time.